Welcome to another episode of The Brilliant Brand Show. In this episode, I'm talking about rule number four for building a brilliant church brand in an episode called Culture is King. Welcome to The Brilliant Brands Show. I'm Justin Keller, former accidental marketer and creative director turned church branding expert and entrepreneur. Each episode, I'm unpacking the strategies that I've used to help churches all across America make their story their brand visuals, and their marketing so brilliantly clear that it's impossible to ignore them. And now, it's your turn. I hope you're ready to challenge the way you see things, rebel against complacency, comfort, and conformity, and find your untold brilliance. Now, let the show begin. Welcome to this episode of The Brilliant Brand Show. I'm Justin Keller, your host, and I'm actually recording this episode out here in Nashville today from our Airbnb as we're out here working with a great church and shooting some videos for them as we're about to roll out a rebrand with them in just a few weeks. And so we wanted to make sure that we still got this episode out to you. So I hope you enjoy it. And I just want to start out like I do with every episode and just tell you I'm grateful. I'm grateful for those of you who are actually taking the time to listen to this. You're actually taking the time to send me feedback and you're taking the time to rate and review the show. I really appreciate it. You know, this show, when I started it, uh, the goal was let's help one person. And I was going to keep doing episode after episode, even if it was for one person. But I want to share something exciting with you. And I know in a world where, you know, there's podcasts out there that have 70,000 downloads an episode, 20,000, 80,000, it doesn't matter. There's a lot more than ours. I don't want to wait till there's a lot of big things to celebrate. I want to celebrate the process and the small wins along the way. And for us, last week, we passed 1,000 total downloads. And that's only because you're taking the time to listen to this show and make it part of your week and what you're doing there as a church. And so I just want to tell you I'm grateful for that, even if it is only one person downloading it 1,000 times still. That's a small win for us, and you're part of that. So thank you. Now, every week on this show, the goal is this, that I help you learn what it takes to make your brand story, your brand visuals, and your marketing for your church impossible to ignore. And we're going to do that again this week in an episode where I'm talking about rule number four for building a brilliant brand. Now, there are 10 rules for building a brilliant brand, all from my book, Rebel Brands. And I haven't taken a lot of time to share with you how you can access that uh, a whole lot. But one of the things I'd love for you to do is you don't have to go buy the book yet. I love it if you do, but you don't have to buy it yet. Why don't you just start with a free chapter? I've got the first chapter for you that you can download and get kind of a feel for what the book is about and the premise behind what is the book Rebel Brands all about. So you can go to brilliantbrands.com forward slash free dash chapter, and you can get uh, chapter one of Rebel Brands, which is where these episodes where I'm talking about the rules for building a brilliant brand are all based from. Now, if you want a full copy of the book for free, a digital copy of it, uh, you can actually just go to circle50.com forward slash Q and A, and you can submit your question that you have about marketing or branding for your church. And in return, I want to give you a digital copy of the book. But what I wanted to do, something a little different uh, at the beginning of this episode, and I, I realized I hadn't taken a lot of time to give you a lot of context behind why it's called uh, brilliant, uh, Rebel Brands, the 10 new rules for building a brilliant brand. So what were the old rules? We haven't talked about that, and I'm not going to dive into that, but I wanted to talk to you about what rules have changed and why the rules have changed and give you some context behind that so that you understand why I'm stressing and challenging you so much to think different about the way you communicate and market your church. So I just wanted to give you a few here today to bring some context to that. You know, first, the rules have changed on how you communicate, you market, and message your church because the amount of times that people are showing up physically to attend your church, have, it's diminished greatly. Um, so I think it's Barna, the Barna group, and we'll look for a link to share this stat with you. But I know years ago that they had put out a report that said people are showing up at your church physically one out of three Sundays. Even maybe last year, I heard a stat that was as few as one out of four Sundays that people are showing up physically at your church. Now, let's just assume that it's one out of three or even you know, two out of four or whatever that looks like. They're not coming every single week. And so if you want to be effective to communicate to your church, it's no longer just enough to ask people to show up. If that's your strategy for reaching people is saying, show up where we are, 
You're missing a great opportunity. The rules have changed. You can't just ask people to show up. Like when I was growing up, you just went to church every single Sunday. That's not how it is anymore. And asking people to show up isn't enough. Another reason, the market is saturated and and cluttered. So there isn't just one you. I know that might sort of uh, be hard to accept right away. You are unique, but it doesn't mean that there's only one church in people's minds. The market says, and your audience says, there's another you. If you can't keep your, your church congregation, if you can't keep people connected and bought in, they don't have this fear that there's no other church. They know that there's just another church, maybe down the road. There is another you in their mind. And that doesn't diminish your uniqueness at all, but it, it does us good to think about it in this perspective that our audience, if we let them down, if we can't keep them bought in, they see another church down the road. There's another you, you know, thinking that our innovation, our creativity, uh, the features that we offer are enough. That's not enough anymore because the market is seeing creativity all over the place. They see it on TV, social media, you know, just to say you use videos inside of your service. I mean, there's kids that are 12 years old that know how to code websites and make videos. You know, they're not Uh, shocked when they see creativity anymore either. That's not our selling point. So it's changed. The market is cluttered with a lot of innovation, a lot of creativity. And then another reason the market is pickier. By the way, when I'm saying market, I think it's important to specify. I'm just talking about the people that you're trying to reach. And I know that this sounds like a business term to say, we're not trying to market or reach a market. Yes, you are. You're trying to reach people. And that's called your market that you're trying to reach. And if you're looking for me to be really spiritual about things on this show, that's not going to happen. I'm just being practical. And so when I say market, it's the people we're trying to reach. And they are pickier. They've been taught to be selective. The market is given options. Let's just even think about it from the perspective of not even searching for a church right now. Let's just think about you and I. Like if we're looking for a burger place, I love burgers. So this is probably not the only time I'm going to reference this on the show. But if we go to a, a, a new burger spot, and the burger is not great, the service isn't great, we're not worried that this is the only place we can find a burger. There are other places. And so we've been taught to be pickier just by default because we have options around us. And so those are just a few of the reasons why the rules have changed for how we need to communicate and market to our churches. And so the bottom line is this, that what worked a decade ago, what worked maybe even three to five years ago, it's just not going to cut it anymore. You know, when it comes to keeping your church engaged, when it comes to even keeping your staff engaged and keeping people engaged and showing up at your church, what used to work doesn't work the same anymore. And so what are you left to do? We've all heard it, evolve or die. And that is, it seems extreme, but that's the case. I, I, I just believe that as churches, there's so much on the line for what we're doing and you can't really talk about having such a great purpose and choose to stay the same. I would actually go on to say that it's, it's maybe even arrogant for any organization, my business, your church, to just expect that people are going to adapt to us and not the other way around. That's, that's a little arrogant because if your purpose is so great, you will change, you will evolve, and you'll do whatever it takes to be as effective as possible. And so that's just a little bit of context for the premise of Rebel Brands, sort of the heart behind it, why I even wrote that, that book, and what these rules are all about. It's really simple. I just want to challenge the way you're thinking so that you can be as effective as possible as a church. So really at this point, you know, either you don't agree and you can just keep doing things the same that you've been doing it, and that's fine. But... I do believe that there are a handful of others out there and maybe even more than that, that are willing to say, you know what? You're right. I think things have changed. It's not the same. What do we need to do? How do we be more effective to reach people, engage them and make the greatest impact possible? So if that's you, you're still listening. Let's keep going on to rule number four for building your brilliant church brand. And that rule is culture is king. I'm really excited about this episode because uh, when I talk about culture and brand, sometimes it looks like uh, you know people are confused. How is culture part of your brand is one of the questions I get sometimes because it's easy to think that our brand is just the visuals. It's the logos. It's the colors. It's all of, all of the stuff that we see. But 
culture is a big part of your brand because, uh, you know, in the book, I'm talk, I talk about the five components that make up all brands. Okay, so the, f- the first one is voice, and then it's visuals, the experience, the brand strategy, and then culture is, is part of that. There's five components that make up every brand. And we, over, we tend to overlook culture um, at, because it's not the first thing that we see. But if you go back, and I believe it's episode number three of this podcast, go back and listen to it. I talk about rule number one for building a brilliant church brand. And that rule is that your brand is what others say you are. Now, if your brand is defined by what others say you are, that really boils down to it is how you are described. And a big part of how you are described is being shaped by the culture that you create for your organization. Now, let's just look at this definition that I I have for brand culture, all right, real quick here. So brand culture, it's just a simple definition, but it's the behaviors and beliefs that are formed in and outside of your brand, all right? Brand culture, the behaviors and beliefs that are formed in and outside of your brand. So think about it like every decision you make, all right, as an organization. Those decisions are creating behaviors. They're creating beliefs. Uh, Where you put your priority for your resources as a church, that's creating beliefs about what matters to you. Um, How you value staff, something as simple as that. That's creating behaviors and beliefs about your organization. How you respond to feedback. I know that seems simple, but even that is creating a belief about your brand that are they going to respond? Do they care about what I am saying when I give them feedback? If I'm a staff member or if I'm congregation speaking into things, all of these things matter. And the list goes on because your brand is being shaped by a thousand different touch points, but these are all part of shaping your culture. And so one of the things that's important for us to realize as we get going into this episode is that Your culture is king. It is a big part of what makes your brand. It's a big part of what defines uh, the way that people describe you as a brand. And here's the thing about culture. You can't speak your culture into existence. Culture isn't something that you say. It's something that you live. So when I'm working with churches and different organizations, a lot of times they're talking about developing culture and they just think, well, if we just create new values, it's going to help shape our culture. But having your value stated that doesn't equal culture. They think that we just need more staff meetings. We need to cast more vision and make this vision clear to people. Guess what? Vision doesn't equal culture. Culture is shaped by your actions more than your words. So for example, when we talk about it shaping, uh, being culture being shaped by actions. Let's say you have a team member on staff and you promise them a promotion. Your culture is being shaped by the decision that happens here. And let's pretend that they met all their goals. Let's pretend that they did everything they were asked, but there was no promotion and maybe even no mention of it. You're shaping a culture of they don't deliver on what they promise. They don't value me and they don't care about my personal development. So even if you are telling your staff that we value people, inside of your meetings or when you're talking from the the pulpit and the stage on a Sunday to your congregation, if you're saying how much you value people, that one decision to not give that staff member the promotion and even acknowledge them, it says that you don't value people, even if you're trying to say you have a culture that does. And I know some of you are thinking, Justin, that's extreme. That's one case, but it's important to look at this a little bit different. So let's just dive into this one and, and pretend that it is about a staff member. That's one case, right? All right. Well, how does that impact your whole brand? Guess what? People talk. That staff member has a family and especially might have a spouse that's watching what has happened. So they're, they're shaping a belief about the organization that culture is being shaped by that. And guess what? So now that went from one person, a staff member to a spouse, that's two people. And then maybe that spouse has a friend and they're talking about the way that their spouse is being treated on staff. Well, that friend has another friend and you can see how it compounds. And that's exactly how culture is deteriorated and defined is by it's these compound actions and these words that people use to describe you, these behaviors and beliefs that they have about the organization. So, because at the end of the day, even if you really want to value that person, it's being defined by your actions. 
So what I want to really talk about inside of this episode is that your culture and your brand is built more on advocates than it is on awareness. And I, and I talk a lot about this in the, in the chapter uh, of the book um, here where I'm talking about culture is king, because what we've been taught to believe, what used to work was you do marketing through promotions. And that's what really defines your brand. That's what helps engage people. But the shift that has happened is your brand is being built more by the advocates of your brand than it is by awareness. Just like that we talked about that staff member. If they're not you know, for you as an organization, they're out talking negative, that is deteriorating your brand. That is defining your brand. And so we have to look at branding as something that starts internally. And we have to look at it as that it's not just something that we build by marketing. Let's talk about Nike maybe. Let's look at uh, them as an example. Let's say Nike spends $20 million on an ad for a new shoe. I don't know their budget for new shoes, but let's pretend that it's $20 million to market a new shoe. If that new shoe, no matter how sexy, no matter how good looking it is, if that shoe falls apart for everybody, the belief that will be formed about Nike is that Nike doesn't have a culture of excellence, that Nike doesn't have a culture of quality. Even if Nike tries to proclaim that they do, it, it's the perceptions that are the truth in this case. And it also is backed up by the product in this case that isn't delivering. And so even if they spent hours and hours talking about quality internally, if they didn't deliver on it, the culture is now being shaped that they don't value excellence. They don't value, value quality and they put out bad products. And so what it's doing is it's shaping a belief about the product. And so they could come out with the next shoe that they're advertising and marketing. And if they're trying to talk about the quality of the shoe, guess what? People are going to remember, wait, that's not true. That last shoe fell apart on them. So it's, it's important to, be, to look at this and say that is building our brand as much as our marketing is because it's shaping beliefs. Now I want to talk about, we talked about the belief side of it just a little bit. I want to talk about the behavior side of it and just how important it is in, in shaping culture. You know, when I was on staff as a creative director, uh, and, it, and it's taken me years to feel probably comfortable talking about this, but I really overworked my staff. Even when I started my business, I don't think I really respected people's time um, because uh, I, I valued doing a lot of big things, getting big projects done more than I did really worrying about people's individual lives to some, time, uh, to some extent. And it's hard to admit that, but I, I think that we all have uh, downfalls and that was one of my big ones early on in, in my leadership. And where it really came from was, it wasn't my pastor's fault when I was on staff that I overworked my, my, my team. It wasn't my pastor's fault. Um, that's not what he actually wanted me to do. But what, what had happened was I felt like I was being rewarded every time that we did the impossible, that we did really big things. And even if it was killing my team to get it done, I remember sitting in meetings and being celebrated for getting the impossible done. And I started to believe, okay, we're talking about the beliefs and behaviors that are shaped inside of us. That's what forms culture. I actually started to believe that my organization, that my leadership valued loyalty to the point of making the church my priority and then doing whatever it takes to get things done more than it did people's time. And now this was my fault to take it that far. That is not something that I'm blaming that leadership for at all, but culture was being rewarded that the, the culture that was being created was one that I was being rewarded for working really, really hard and making, and probably even getting my priorities out of whack. And so culture is king because that's what forms the beliefs and behaviors that are inside of our organization. You know, it formed a, be, a behavior inside of me and a belief inside of me that I'm going to overwork myself. And in return, I'm going to overwork my staff. And that's where it gets dangerous that it doesn't seem like that's defining our brand, but if my team members are out talking about how hard, how, how much I overwork them, that's a direct reflection on the organization. And so it's a big deal because at the end of the day, uh, <laughs> there is really no grace for a crappy culture. And, and I don't know how else to say it, but you know, if you have a crappy culture, it's, it's hard to overcome that you can have a pretty crappy logo or a pretty terrible website and people will have some grace. But when there's a crappy culture, there isn't grace. People don't buy in, they lose trust 
and they move on really, really quickly, like I talked about at the beginning, and they find another you. And I say all this to lead to a strategy that I think um, will change your organization if you really, really apply this. And so what I want us to think about is this. Let's think differently. That we don't want to focus on just building brand awareness through our marketing. Okay, we don't want to focus on just building brand awareness through promotions and advertising. What I want to ask you to do is to have a strategy as an organization that thinks about marketing internally first. I, there's actually, I would call it free advertising and free brand awareness that exists, and it's inside of your people. It's inside of your staff, and it's inside of your congregation. And so I want us to focus on the internal part of our brand for this episode and building our brands from the inside out and the culture from the inside out. So before you ever invest in external awareness, before you start investing in big marketing campaigns externally, I want to challenge you to start building and investing in your internal culture. And that's going to start with your staff, your core volunteers and your congregation. Okay. Now, if you look at your marketing budget, I want you to ask yourself, is this focused on reaching more people? But and a lot of ours are, you know, we look at putting out Facebook ads or we look at spending money on putting out, uh, you know, mailers, even in, for some of us in different forms of marketing and advertising, a lot of it is focused on actually reaching more people. But what would happen if we made a shift as an organization? What if our marketing budget wasn't just focused on reaching more, but it was actually focused on developing more of a relationship with who we have right now. Um, one of the things that made me think about this was a lot of churches will say, uh, and, and, and I know you're just encouraging people to bring people to church, but we'll say from the platform, bring your friends, be a bringer. You've maybe said things like this, and I'm not saying that you can't, but when we think about it, I, I just wonder what's the motivation for that? Because if, if it's always about, hey, just bring somebody, doesn't that sound a little bit like we're just trying to reach more? What if we were focused more on investing in who we have? I really do believe that if we invest greater in who we have, our staff, our volunteers, our congregation, I don't think we'll have to ask them to bring who they know. You know, in business, I can't just tell a network of relationships that I have to send more work my way. You know, I earn it. I earn it by building advocates. And I do that by doing great work, for them by adding value to them first, helping them win and succeed first and doing it enough that they're going to start sending people my way. And that's what happens. What I'm doing first is helping the people that are closest to me win the network relationships that I have. I'm helping them win. And you know what? They're sending people my way and helping me win. And I really believe that for churches, what that looks like is if you help people win, if you help your staff win, if you help your congregation win, if you help your volunteers win, that they're going to invite others. Help people win and they'll invite others. Simon Sinek has a, a great quote, and I'm talking right now about culture being shaped and letting that thing start internally instead of just trying to build brand awareness. Let's build advocates because Simon Sinek's quote really reinforces that. He said this, customers will never love a company until employees love it first. And I, I want to rephrase that just a little bit and steal Simon's words and, and say it like this, that Congregations will never love a church until a staff loves it first. And I'm not talking about some, I love my church campaign that we force on people. I'm talking about a genuine buy-in and belief in the organization and what they do starting internally because we've created advocates with our staff. We've created advocates with our core volunteers and they genuinely love this place. They genuinely love what we're doing. They genuinely believe in it. And that's contagious. Conviction and belief are probably the most contagious, um, you know, traits of any brand. And that starts with when our staff has that and our congregation has that, our core volunteers, that spreads. And so your advertising needs to shift from being external minded instead of being just let's reach more people. Your advertising needs to shift and it needs to start internally and not externally. Now, what I want to do is I want to look at three keys to building brand advocates internally. This episode is focused on building your brand internally first, okay? And, and creating advocates internally before we even think about marketing externally. So I'm not going to go into the external part of it yet. I really want to just start about thinking about 
specifically probably your staff in this case and core volunteers and core leadership that you have. So the three keys to building brand advocates internally. One, create belief. Okay, you have to create a belief that they believe what you say, they believe in what you're doing, and they believe that it matters. Belief is actually created by making it, person, making it personal to each person. So you can't force belief on somebody. You can't just tell them, hey, this is what matters to us. You know, make it matter to you. You have to make your purpose personal to your staff. And, and you have to do that by just spending time and investing in people and helping them see what matters to you, finding out how that aligns with what matters to them and letting them create that belief that I believe what they say, they back it up, they do what they say, I believe in what we're doing and I believe that it matters. And then number two, provide opportunity. All right, we're talking about creating brand advocates internally first, we gotta provide opportunity. Is there an opportunity for my passion to fit here? Is there opportunity for my voice to be heard? And is there an opportunity for me to grow? See, without opportunity, there's no hope. I've never, I've never talked to somebody leaving a job and they said, hey, guess what? I'm leaving my job. There's just too many opportunities for me. That doesn't happen. But on the flip side, I have talked to quite a few p- talented people that have said, you know, there's just no opportunity for me. My passions, you know, don't seem to fit here. They just have a job they need me to get done. There's no opportunity for my voice to really be heard and for me to contribute. There's no opportunity for me to grow. I have heard of people leaving for those reasons. And so one of the things that I've done, and, I'm, and this is just something uh, real practical for you when you're hiring people, the, the way that I show that I want to create opportunity for them, that I want to provide opportunity, is I ask a simple question in every single interview when I'm hiring somebody, and that's this. How do you see your skills benefiting the organization beyond your role? And I do this for a few reasons, but first it shows me what they feel passionate about because, you know, let's, we're all looking for jobs sometimes at some point in our lives and our careers. And sometimes the first motivation is really just pay the bills. You're willing to take on a role and a job that you don't fit perfectly, but it, it'll help pa- uh, pay the bills. So, and we need that sometimes in organizations, they can help meet a need right now, an immediate need, but you want to, you don't want just people to meet an immediate need. Your, your culture is going to be strengthened when they can meet that immediate need, but you actually understand what they're passionate about and you can see them fitting beyond the role. And so it shows me that, uh, shows me what they're passionate about because they start talking about things that aren't even related to the job. And then, um, it gives me a true read on what really matters to them. And then it also shows me, do they have the ability to see beyond the role? So that simple question, how do you see your skills benefit in the organization beyond the role? It helps me show them that I see opportunity for them beyond this. And it helps them begin the job, begin the, the, the relationship with the idea of, wait, they talked about going beyond the role, man, they must really care about me having an opportunity to advance. So it's mostly for them, but it is also for me internally. Then the last thing, third, develop accountability. And that means you as a leader being accountable to what you promise internally, you have to deliver on what you say, you have to. And then number two, you have to, uh, as a leader, be accountable to what you promise externally to people. And then last, your staff being accountable to what, they, what you promise as an organization as a whole. You have to have that accountability. That accountability has to be simple. It can't be complex and it has to be defined and it can't be assumed. These are three critical components to really creating internal brand advocates, when you can create belief inside of your team and your staff, when you provide an opportunity for them. But this is critical that there's that accountability and it's not complex. It's really simple. Everyone's moving in the same path, accountable to the same set of rules that we're abiding by. And for us, the, the framework that I've created, the Brilliant Brands framework, we use brand promises for that. And um, if you want to learn more about that, you can at brilliantbrands.com. But w- the goal is this, that we make the accountability is simple, not complex, that it's defined and it's not just assumed. All right. So I've talked about the keys to building advocates from a, I guess, a belief standpoint. And I just wanted to close out by giving you a quick challenge as an organization, a, a organization, because I know what I'm asking you to do is a little different. I don't want to overwhelm you. Uh, I think in a future episode, I want to talk more about what are some specific things that we can do to um, see our staff live this out, see our volunteers live this out and become those advocates that are out there talking about the brand. I'm going to save that for another episode. So what I want to leave you with is first, 
let's just start thinking about marketing as and branding as something that starts internally first. And so the number one, what I want you to do is look at what you're spending on external marketing. If you have the ability to do this, I want to challenge you to sit down with your leadership if you're just a designer on staff at a church. Um, but as organizations, let's do this this week. Let's look at what we're spending on external marketing. And then spend. that's like everything that you're doing to reach more people. Let's put that in the category of reaching more people. And then what I want you to do is to quantify what's the return on investment on those things that we're doing. What are we seeing as a result from as a result of doing this. So create from that a list of essential marketing items and non-essential. So I would say the external things that are actually bringing more people in, they're, um, they're, they're, you're seeing an impact from them, it's effective. That could be one of your essential items in the marketing list. And then over on the other list, those other things that you're not seeing anything come from it, put that in the non-essential. And then what I want you to do is third, think about how you can reinvest some of your external marketing back into internal branding and marketing by creating advocates with your staff and investing back into core volunteers. So I'll, I want you to first just do those first three things this week. Start thinking about what that could look like. I don't want to tell you the answers on everything you should do for your team to invest back in them. We are going to dive in that into another ap episode. But for now, let's just start seeing our advertising and our marketing as culture building. Okay? Not just brand awareness that we do through promotions and it starts internally first because culture is king. All right. So I hope this episode challenged your thinking just a little bit. And just as a reminder, you can go ahead and get that free chapter of rebel brands at brilliantbrands.com forward slash free dash chapter. And, um, Again, learn more about the Brilliant Brands Framework at brilliantbrands.com. There's lots there for you. But I just want to thank you for listening to this episode. And even more, those of you who've actually taken the time to rate and review the show and give me your feedback. Um, I've had some emails come in from some of you, and you can continue to do that. Let me know what you're thinking about. And you can send me that email, justin at justinkeller.com. But most of all, just thank you to those of you who are saying, yes, keep challenging me. And then you're doing this. You're taking action on this. I'm getting feedback from some of you on the action that you're taking. And you know what? All of this stuff is all great in theory, but it really doesn't make a difference if you don't put it to action. And so I want to challenge you those three things that I gave you to take action on this week. Put those to action. So, all right. As always, send me your feedback, rate and review the show. I appreciate that. It means the world to me. And until the next episode, make today great. Thank you for listening to today's episode. The Brilliant Brand Show is powered by Circle 50 Creative. You can learn more about how we help ministries solve critical ministry moments with the right message, brand visuals, and strategies at circle50.com.